train in the next few days. Back to you, Caroline. Thank you, Penny. On to cricket and in the latest county championship matches, Hampshire have made a good start against Durham. The visitors are 100 for six, while Surrey are struggling against Glamorgan, losing six wickets for 126 at lunch. You might not be able to miss it. Tonight is the big World Cup game for England, of course, against Sweden. Even though England have won both their matches so far, their performances haven't exactly been sparkling. One of the reasons given has been the hot weather. Well, a sports scientist from the University of Brighton thinks he has the answer. Paul Castle says England's footballers should have their legs chilled before matches in hot weather. The idea is to chill the thigh muscles for 20 minutes, which lowers the overall body temperature. He's carried out research which shows it stops players tiring so quickly in the heat. Well, that's it from me for now. Sally Taylor is here with Saturday. That's at half past six here on BBC One. Join us then if you can. Goodbye. So, hats and horses on parade next on BBC One. The BBC's Summer of Sport continues with live coverage on day one of Royal Ascot. Wherever you go, you can take BBC News with you. Just text NEWS to 81010 to access the latest stories from the BBC News website on your mobile phone or go to bbc.co.uk slash news. BBC News, whenever you need to know. I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. Children's party at the palace. It's intense. You feel the whole world watching. You're thinking, am I fast enough? Or is the other guy quicker? There are 72 cameras on you. So the last thing you want is to make a mistake. As soon as the ball leaves the racket, I'm on it. That ball is mine. I'd say Wimbledon is the best two weeks of the year. Wimbledon. Follow it from every angle. Starts Monday on the BBC. Don't forget that Neighbours is later today at 5.35. That's because right now, one of the great social events in the racing calendar, live on BBC One, we join Claire Balding for high stakes and high fashion on the opening day of Royal Ascot. Think of it, isn't it? Absolutely. Who'd have thought it? A British sporting stadium delivered on time, on budget, and on a scale like this. It is truly magnificent, utterly worthy for the setting of one of the greatest race meetings you'll find anywhere in the world. It's good to be back. Good afternoon and welcome. Royal Ascot is back at its home, but it doesn't look like it ever did before. And if the huge crowd are starting to look a little bemused, it's because they're finding their feet. That used to be the paddock there. This ladies and gents lose over here used to be our studio, and that general area used to be the winner's enclosure. But the whole thing has moved. It was knocked down. They spent £200 million rebuilding it, and it looks fantastic. HOK Sport Architecture can be given the credit for this grand slam. I've never seen anything like it in the world. They also built Cardiff Millennium Stadium, Stadium Australia. They designed, or they're the architects for Wembley, which as you know is yet to be completed, and Arsenal's new home, the Emirates Stadium. Now what they were looking for was to try and get a feel of the countryside, something that reflected 
the Windsor Great Park, Ascot Heath, they've actually built the grandstand on what they call structural trees and that parasol roof is suspended on the trees so there's a lot of light in the middle of the gallery. The grandstand runs on floors from left to right as opposed to being sort of segregated in vertical lines. It is one huge horizontal sweep and the curve of it Apologies for fighting the band slightly. The Coldstream and Scots Guards are playing right next to me. But the curve of, of both the roof and the grandstand itself intended to give the race goers the best possible view of each other as well as of the racing. Because as you probably know, Royal Ascot is the best people watching occasion of the year. And we will, of course, have all the fashion, all the form, all the fun, and all the finesse of this great meeting. We'll also be taking you to places you've never been before, into the jockey's changing room. Mick Canan sitting down there, Karen McAvoy as well. And uh, Frankie Dottori has just arrived as well. And there's Kieran Fallon out walking the course earlier. He's got some big, big rides coming up over the next five days when we will be showing you 24 hour races, 17 hours worth of coverage and a huge finale from the band. That must mean one thing and one thing only. They've spotted my co-host, the one and only Willie Carson. <laughs> How Good are afternoon, Kathy. <laughs> How are you? Very well, isn't it marvellous? The only thing I've found to be the same is the race card. They've made the race card exactly they have done for the last 20 or 30 years. That hasn't changed, but isn't it beautiful, this grandstand? It is it's fantastic. marvellous. Now, you went and had a little wander around, yes. didn't you? What did you I think? went up into the panoramic restaurant, and uh, it was a little bit hot. That was the only criticism I had up there. But everybody was sitting down having a very, very nice meal. And uh, when you get up to the sixth floor, you can look down into the galleria, and you can see all these open spaces. And people sitting down there having lunch. You know, it, it's, it's a, a, a lovely... Lovely airy grandstand. 57,000 people that grandstand holds, and they'll get an awful lot more out in the open spaces as well. When I was down at the old paddock, you know, there's picnic tables, there's marquees down they there put, as well. There's so much space. And they've put more big trees in as well. I don't know where they've come up, but there's massive big trees that have been planted. You can't put big trees. Well, they are. Big trees they weren't in. there before. Are you sure? Yes, you just there didn't was, notice them before. The, well, maybe I didn't notice them, but <laughs> they You can't suddenly like transplant a, ancient a, trees, can well, you? Well, they're very big trees, and oh. it's a lovely parkland down there. You can see down there now and you would think you are in the countryside. Well it's amazing when you think Ascot will celebrate its tercentenary in 2011. It was back in 1711 that Queen Anne came riding out here on the heath and said that looks a rather marvellous place for thoroughbred race. Well they weren't thoroughbreds in those days but for horses to gallop yes, at were. full they're stretch. Still thoroughbreds now. No I don't think they well, were. No they were old hunters when they had the first meeting here they were big heavy slow plodders. They went they ran over like four miles and had various different. I've learned know, the first lesson today don't argue. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are looking forward to five fabulous days at Royal Ascot 2006. Here are some of the racing highlights. Well, as well as being joined by Willie Carson, I also have the benefit of the very sharp tongue and the sharp mind of James Sherwood, a cult figure you've been described as for your waspish, waspish comments about no, what people wear. I'm quite charmed by that. I think I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted to be back, and I think it promises to be a very, very well-dressed year. 
Well, let's start with the top of the tree, if you like, because just approaching the Golden Gates is the Royal Procession. The opening day of Royal Ascot 2006 also sees the official opening of the grandstand. Her Majesty the Queen carrying out the opening ceremony at uh, just after two o'clock, I should think, by the time she makes her way down in front of the paddock. As always, the first carriage, which uh, is the Queen's carriage, is drawn by Windsor Greys. That has been the tradition for, well, as long as anybody can remember, uh, so that the royal carriage stands out from the others. The Queen has a great tradition of both attending Royal Ascot and having runners here as well. She's had 19 Royal Ascot winners over the years, and there she is resplendent in royal blue, Godolphin blue possibly, alongside the Duke of Edinburgh, and also in the first carriage, Lord Vesti, closest to the camera, and on the far side, the Duke of York. You see there the full glory of the Landors. They're very comfortable, got great suspension in these carriages. And it really is the most magnificent sight as this full-scale procession makes its way down the middle of the newly designed race course. It's not just the grandstand that's new, the race course is new as well. It has been moved, shifted significantly to the left as we look at it. And the area of ground they're crossing over now has an underpass with the road going underneath. It used to be a grassed over tarmac path. Now it's an underpath. It'll be much smoother this ride than it has been in the past. The second carriage, we have the Prince of Wales on the far side facing forward alongside the Duchess of Cornwall. Peter Phillips, a son of the Princess Royal, closest to us. And Sir Mark Prescott in the black top hat with his back. He's explaining the, the new design of the race course, I suspect. Uh, Sir Mark Prescott, very successful trainer, had his first classic winner with Confidential Lady when she won the French Oaks just a couple of weeks ago. Windsor Grey is leading the procession as well as drawing the first carriage. They've all come down from the Royal Mews. And in the third carriage, we have the Earl of Wessex. We have the Countess of Wessex in pale pink there. The Princess Royal on the far side facing forwards. And Mr. Christopher Rhys-Jones, who is father of the Countess of Wessex. And you can see the beautiful sunshine and the heat haze just making that whole scene look utterly timeless. So much of what we've shown you already so far in the program is, is very modern, very 21st century. But this scene stretching back to the mid 19th century remains as ageless and perfectly timeless as ever. Well, talking of looking back through the years, the Queen, I was telling you, first enjoyed a Royal Ascot winner here in 1952 in fact or her first winner was in 1952 before she came to the throne her first really good horse was called Oriel who was narrowly beaten in the 1953 derby and then came here to Ascot to win the King George she's had 19 Royal Ascot winners in total let's hear why and how Her Majesty fell in love with racing in her own words <laughs> I suppose I first became interested in racing during the war, when my father had leased Big Game and Sun Chariot from the National Stud. And my father took me down to Beckhampton to see them working, which I had never seen before, and I was able to pat them in the stable afterwards. I'd never felt the satiny softness of a thoroughbred before. It was a wonderful feeling. Well, Oriel's always been an independent and frankly naughty character. He was often loose at Newmarket when he was in training, which I think was why it didn't disturb him when he got loose at Ascot before he won the King George VI that year. But it's still the Queen's Oriel in the lead. The cheers will be heard from here to Silverstone if Oriel can win. And Oriel is hanging on very well at the moment with about 100 yards to go. It's Oriel from Vamos and Duras. Vamos on the right and Duras on the left. Vamos for France is catching Oriel. There's 50 yards to go. No, Oriel can Oriel hang on. And at the post, Oriel wins. Absolutely fantastic to hear the Queen talking herself, James, about why and how the whole love affair with racing developed. I think it's very interesting that the Queen's voice has dropped a few registers recently, and you know, she's a little less shrill than she used to be. Let's have a closer look then at, at what the Queen is wearing. Well, appropriately enough, the Queen is wearing 
wearing royal blue and it looks rather marvellous on her. I always say she's, you know, one of the best dressed ladies at Asuka because she knows, you know, this is her working wardrobe. She knows what to do. The rest of us, this is dressing up for the Queen's is every day. And um, the, the designer I'm re reliably told is Karl Ludwig and it's a royal blue crepe coat with a silk satin multicoloured dress. The hat is by one of her favourite milliners, Philip Somerville. The fanfare announcing the arrival of Her Majesty the Queen and the Royal Procession through this new tunnel that comes right under the heart of the grandstand. This is the way the runners will be making their way out onto the course and back in again as they sweep through into this amazing new paddock which holds 8,000 people, almost the size of a mini stadium for pop concerts or something. And it's packed, it's absolutely packed with people waiting to get a closer glimpse of the Queen and the Royal Party. But well, there's certainly lots of posing potential here. You know, there are more pathways, which is rather nice for girls wearing heels, that you can actually clack around and see and be seen, which is what we like at Royal Ascot. Now, this is the first time that the Queen will have seen the new Royal Ascot in all its glory. No doubt she's had a few private trips here to check on the progress of things, but even up until 9 o'clock this morning, they were raking gravel and putting plants in position and making sure everything was perfect and the applause ringing out as the monarch enters this new parade ring. First duty of the Queen will be to do the official opening of the grandstand. You can see the jockeys keeping an eye on it as well. Frankie de Tori on the right there. Champion jockey Jamie Spencer was in there as well. Ryan Moore there sitting on the bench with his knees up. He's going great at the moment, riding lots and lots of winners. They'll be hoping to walk into this winner's enclosure on their own a little later this afternoon. But at the moment, they're all keeping their eye on something that is utterly unique in world racing. The only place that can claim to have a royal procession is Royal Ascot. It started actually in 1825 when the King, leading four other coaches with members of the Royal Party, drove up the centre of the race course in front of the crowds and it's continued to the present day, including last year at York. And I think probably there's more affection and more reaction this year because it's been missing from Berkshire. It's very nice to hear a big cheer from Duchess of Cornwall, I think. It is a magnificent sight. The carriage is coming very close in front of us right now and you can see the strength of the horses pulling the carriages and how comfortable they are inside. There's a fair amount of room. You wouldn't want to be squashed up too close with people in a carriage, but there is a plenty of knee room, as they say. The Windsor Greys standing to attention, behaving themselves impeccably. Some of these horses are quite young and inexperienced as royal processions go, which is why they played the fanfare before the horses came in. Uh, so that they could make sure there wasn't any danger of the horses getting upset by the noise, but a few of them pouring the ground. But Michael Hill's there on the right. He's got a big chance later on this afternoon with La Cucaracha in the King's Stand Stakes. And I wonder what the Australian connections of the three Australian runners we've got coming up, I wonder what they make of the grandeur of this. Do you like the design of the building, James? I do. I think it looks sensational, truly sensational. It's got the most beautiful lines to it. I mean, I think it's a really... It's, it's very sinuous, isn't it? It's quite a sexy race. <laughs> sexy sexy building. Stand. James, yes. only you could quite. say that a building was sexy, but I will bow to your better judgment. Now, of course, as well, the um, Royal Party will have a brand new Royal Box. The Royal Box looks sensational. It, it almost looks like a futuristic airship. And it's like Star Trek, isn't it? Yeah, look at it. I mean, it's a great incredible. view, but it really does look... Special. It looks like it's suspended from the ceiling above it and it's decked out in black and the royal blue that is all over. I wonder if maybe that's why the Queen decided to wear royal blue today because it is the Ascot colour. It's the colour, yes.
Now the horses and carriages are just making their way out of the paddock. And we're awaiting the official opening. The Queen, of course, celebrated her official birthday last week and was present on Saturday at Trooping the Colour. And at 80 years old now, she shows no signs of slowing down. The Duke of Devonshire there on the far side, who is Her Majesty's representative here at Ascot, guiding her to the podium, which will be used for all the trophy presentations after the races later this afternoon. And I understand we will now have the national anthem played by the Coldstream and Scots Guards. Your Majesty, welcome to the new Ascot Racecourse. Ma'am, you have been closely and happily associated with Ascot all your life. And this is the third occasion in your lifetime that this racecourse has been completely redesigned. I very much hope that it is the best. Two years ago, I promised that we would be ready for the start of the 2006 Royal Meeting. And I am very proud to be able to deliver that promise to Your Majesty today. On behalf of all of us at Ascot, all those who have worked on the redevelopment and everybody here today, I thank you for your interest, your enthusiasm, and your support for this endeavor. And I now invite Your Majesty to do us all the great honor of declaring the racecourse open. I am delighted to be here at Ascot for the start of the 206th Royal Meeting and to open the new racecourse and grandstand. The many people and organizations who have contributed to the redevelopment project within such a challenging timescale have my admiration and gratitude. Thanks to their hard work, we can look forward to many years of racing in a world-class environment. May I wish all of you here today and watching at home a most enjoyable day's racing. I have pleasure in declaring the new Ascot officially open. Well, you won't get a grander opening of a sporting grandstand than that. And the Queen with her message for both those here at the racecourse and you watching at home. I think she knows that this design just provides the perfect stage for the greatest race meeting in the world. The Duchess of Cornwall there with the Prince of Wales. Prince of Wales will be presenting the trophy for the first race today. And James, the Duchess of Cornwall, she dresses magnificently well, doesn't she? I think she's looking increasingly like a Queen Consort, to be honest. She dresses immaculately. This gold satin is absolutely terrific on her. 
Well, we've had a very good look at the Royal Party. They're going to make their way up to the Royal Box now for the first time to see their facilities out there. Let's go out and about and find out what the people who have come to this grand opening of Royal Ascot make of the new grandstand, the facilities and everything. Rishi, what do they think? Well, Claire, it looks as if uh, the Queen has given the new stand the Royal Seal of Approval. Let's find out from some of the paying public here what do they think. Although I think you're a little bit better than the paying public. You've all got your Royal Enclosure badges. So tell us, first of all, Lauren, all the names are on the, on the badges, so I don't have to worry about remembering all that. Lauren, what do you make of the new stand? It's beautiful, really nice, really modern. OK, Matthew, what about you? I think it's really nice. I'm probably going to come here lots more, I hope. Excellent. I'd love to see more of you. What about you, Alexa? Uh, I think it's really, really great. Yeah, it's much better than the other one. What did you think? One. When last did you come to the other one? Did you come here a couple uh, of years ago? A couple of years ago, yeah. And did you think it was a bit old, needed a change? A bit old, yeah. Needs to change. It needed to change a bit, yeah. Okay, what about you? What are your thoughts on the new stand? I think it's amazing. So I've been watching it being built because my school's nearby, and I think it's grown really well, and it looks really good now. Oh, you've, you've seen, so you've seen the whole development from yeah. close by? Yeah, it's been really good, yeah. Watching Can you it. imagine that they've done this so quickly, though? It's amazing how it's been done so well, and so quickly as well, yeah. Let's get some more views. What, what do you think about the new stand? It's much bigger than I thought. Even though we've seen it being built, to be here, it's, it's stunning. It's probably one of the best race courses going to be in Europe. Listen, ladies, got to go now, but I hope you all have a great day and I hope you all enjoy the new stand. Thank you. Well, it has the seal of approval from the younger racegoers, the older ones as well. It must all be the most enormous relief for the man who has been masterminding this redevelopment for the past, well, nearly two years. Douglas Erskine Crumb, phew. Yes, um, well, that was, you couldn't get much better official opening than that. It was wonderful. And it seems genuinely the Queen likes it. Well, I think so. She's certainly um, come three times during the redevelopment and um, been very enthusiastic about it whenever she's come. Now, how close to the knuckle has this been? I, I saw last minute preparations, I was here early this morning. How much of a sleepless night did you have? Well, no sleepless nights, um, but it has been very close. Uh, it was a very fast tra track programme from the start. And in fact, the stand only took 16 months to build. And I think a lot of people who came on the 27th of May, our pre-opening day, have noticed that it has improved considerably since then. It has. If it was a racehorse, we'd say it's trained on considerably. It's improved yeah, from yes. its first run to its second. Now, the basis for, for the structure of, of this design, you travelled the world looking at grandstands worldwide. You went to Hong Kong, Singapore, yes. Australia, America, all around the place. And it really does match up. Well, I think so. Um, we learnt an awful lot, not only from racecourses, but from a lot of uh, sports stadia around the world. Um, and certainly from Australia and Flemington and Nakayama and Kyoto in Japan and Cranjin in Singapore. Um, of course, Sha Tin in Hong Kong, which is one of the great race courses in the world. And some in the States, um, for example, Santa Anita and Arlington in particular. And Longchamp, um, we mustn't forget the European race courses. And of course, Cheltenham and York, because we do have some of the great race courses in the world already. Nadal Shiva there as well in Dubai, the, the creation of Sheikh Mohammed, I'll be interested, I'll try and find him later and find out what he makes of this because I've, I've never seen anything on a grander scale. I mean, it, it really does, I, I personally think, surpasses those that, that we've seen. I mean, it, Kranji obviously is, is very impressive and Chartin as well, as you mentioned, but, but this is just fabulous. Well, we certainly wanted to build a whole new race course because that's what it is with the new track and the reservoirs and everything else that we've done which um, was literally one of the best race courses in the world and we were fortunate enough to be in the position where we were able to do so. You can just see there a few of the actual details of the new race course, the grandstand, the parade ring, the race course itself and the important thing for professionals involved in the game, you've boosted the prize money, this, this meeting is worth more than it's ever been. Yes, we've put the prize money up 12.5%, no race is worth less than 55,000. Um, uh, but, but going back to the redevelopment, there were two very important principles we wanted to get across. The first one is to bring the action closer to the racegoers, because racegoers actually want to see jockeys and trainers and their heroes and the horses. Um, and indeed, I have to say, the Royal Procession that we've just seen. And the second one is to move people quickly around the race course. And we've got loads of stairs and, and um, lifts, but also 24 sets of escalators to, to move people so they can get to where they want to go very quickly. Well, it is a fabulous achievement, and, and I'm sure many people at home will be thinking, well done you, you've done it, you've pulled it off, it's open. Well, it's a very strong team, um, an incredibly strong team. And we had um, marvellous contractors, designers, um, and our project management team, led by Howard Shipley, is absolutely outstanding. 
Well, I'm thrilled for you and looking forward to the next five days. Thanks, Thank Douglas. Thank you very much. Uh, we talked to some of the people out and about around the race course with Rishi earlier, but also what's hugely important over the next five days is what are people wearing? So Rishi is now with our all-important fashion team. Yes, Claire, the BBC fashion team are out in force. We've got James Sherwood, who you know and you're familiar with, Kate Silverton, ditto, and of course, supermodel, Jody Kidd is with us. So we've got three people who've all made a, a very good start to these five days with us. Kate, what can we look forward to? Well, as we were just saying, that watching the race is just half the fun. It's really the fashion that draws most comment, which is why we've got these guys here. James Acker, the Viper, of course. Strict, strict. strict <laughs> because, of course, it is a strict uh, dress code here. It's the etiquette hurdles that people have to overcome that causes most consternation. So, James, you're going to begin with your take on what works and what doesn't. Right. Well, I think that the, the central point about Ascot is that it's not just a fashion event, it's a very formal event. You know, I think that's where a lot of girls fall down. They turn up dressed like milkmaids from the catwalk and it looks ghastly. I, I hope he's not looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> you look amazing, as oh. ever, and it's lovely to have you with us. I mean, Thank you're you. a keen sportswoman and keen yes. race goer, so what is it like being back as a spectator well, and here? Absolutely wonderful. I've been so excited to see the new Ascot, and the sun is shining, and uh, we've been looking around. There's some fantastic people wearing gorgeous clothes, amazing hats, and then there's also the fashion disaster, so we're going to be checking those out. Yes. We will. But first, let's take a little look. We've been out and about this morning, the three of us, looking at what uh, caught our eye. I think this is an absolutely delightful Ascot outfit. I do like to see a wide-brimmed hat. I think it works very well under, over a pretty face. White, a, a colour this season certainly rather difficult, you know, once it's been covered in champagne after yeah, the first exactly. two hours, or goodness yeah. knows what. Um, polka dots, I, I always, that's far too much. Look at that cleavage, you could dive into it. <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't like the pink. Do you like that? Yeah, I, I, like I think, that. yeah, I think that's very pretty. Very, very pretty. It's gorgeous. What is it? It's kind of like a shimmery. Raffita sort of. Ra yeah, it's a lovely hat. And pink, you know, all those lovely pastel colours, you know, they're very Ascot. But um, I think this year it's gone, it's quite bright, quite colourful this year, I think. And lots of feathers, as usual. James, you said a little yeah. earlier that it looked like there'd been an explosion in a chicken factory, for one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are feathers and there are feathers, aren't there? You know, I, I'm not a great fan of the Fascinator. I think that's a little bit too much. It's Sue Pollard's here, look. <laughs> Why are they called fascinators? I presume it's like a cat with a ball of string, that that's all you look at is the hat bobbing up and down, you know, and it takes the attention off everything else. But um, pretty Love people can wear lovely hats. So. We've also <laughs> set Jodie a challenge. Uh, we yes. asked her to dress for Ascot, not in what she's wearing at the moment, I hasten to add, but we asked her to see if she could dress for Ascot for £150. So find out yeah. how she'll be getting on with that. And we've done our fashion tips for you, Rishi. OK, what's the fashion tip? Well, because we're going to be putting some money down. It's all to raise money for sport relief. Uh, yeah. And uh, we've chosen a horse. We've gone for... Uh, oh, uh, Glamopus. Glamopus, exactly. Glamopus. I wonder yes, why. There's plenty of them. I yeah. thought James might have gone for Dandy Man. I'd certainly gone for that. Of course I have. OK, so course. Glamopus and Dandy Man, two yeah. to look out for from the fashion team. But I'm going for Stormy River in the St James's Palace Stakes. Fingers crossed. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the new weighing room here at Ascot. Ray is with me. You'll have been through many weighing rooms throughout the world. Is this an impressive new one? I walked around this morning. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And what about the racing surface itself? You had a little walk out on the track today. Uh, un unbelievable. Uh, how they put it all together in such a short space of time, I don't know. I thought the stand was fantastic. The race course is unbelievable. OK, now, before we move on to today's action, the jockey who hit the headlines yesterday, I'm afraid, was Robert Winston. We're just going to show you what happened to him because he's picked up a 28-day ban. He is here on the white and green uh, colours. And a horse could confide to Car Carlisle yesterday afternoon. He was the three-to-one favourite. He hits the front. He's already in front here. And he oh, looks as if he's going to go on and win well. The one thing he does do, which he admitted straight away afterwards, is he takes a little bit easily. And here on the outside, with a 25 to 1 chance, who's going to come and do him? Yeah, he rides to the front. They've just gone past the furlong mark. As you can see, Robert's looking round. And he's thinking, I'm just far enough clear. I'll just eat needle out hands and nails. I'm going to win. He looks at the screen here to see clear. He can see this horse coming. And he takes the best action he can. Hands up. He had no chance. Stewards, uh, the, the rules say it is 28 day ban that he's going to get for that. Confide has a chance to make reparations in the 5.45 race though at Thirst this afternoon. He's very likely to go off favourite for that. 
Well, of course, there are two big sporting events taking place at the moment, both on the BBC. The uh, big game, uh, of course, uh, tonight in the football, uh, England and Sweden. And, of course, uh, uh, here at Royal Ascot, we've got five races on the BBC this afternoon. And who uh, better to join us is one of the famous men from 66, Alan Balls down here, a man who loves his racing as well. Uh, Alan, uh, what a fabulous setting now for uh, Ascot here we've got. It's terrific, isn't it? And, uh, I mean... It's a little bit different, being a bit old-fashioned. You know, you miss the old place a little bit because we've been coming quite a lot, lot of years. But uh, things move on, and it's terrific. Yeah, I'm look, really looking forward to the day. Now, you like it better yourself. Anything yep. that you've marked out for the viewers this afternoon? Well, I've I've gone for Major Cado in the first. Uh, Richard Hannan, I think he's, he knows the time of day with the two-year-olds. I'm just uh, I'm just leaving Mickey Shannon alone with this <laughs> one. Uh, I think Pierce will win later on. Pierce, really Michael like Stout, Philly. I, yes, I like that, yeah. Of course, well, uh, tonight, uh, England against Sweden. Uh, how, the, how do you think the World Cup's gone so far? I mean, it's been exciting. England have won a couple of games, but they've not been that impressive, have they? Angus, I was over there uh, last week, and I promise you now, the atmosphere and what's going on there is absolutely fantastic. Uh, everybody's got together. There's parties going on. The Germans have done it really well. They've got these these like lager fest places outside away from the grounds where people can't afford to get into the grounds yeah. because of the tickets and they party all day long the games have been terrific there's been some good stuff played and uh, it, it's just a terrific tournament at the moment yeah okay well i mean any prediction for tonight what do you think is going to happen well i to be quite honest i, I think it's important that they play well uh, we've struggled let's be honest and they're a talented bunch of lads and they should be doing better we all understand that uh, it doesn't matter what team he picks, what formation he plays, they've got to show their intent to the rest of the countries out there tonight and put on a performance for the people back here. Wherever you go, the buntings, the pubs are full, the responsibility they've got, them lads, of putting on a show tonight is very, very important. Never mind who pick, who's picked, you're playing for England tonight, you're playing for the supporters tonight. Let's have a good performance and let's get top of that, that league so we can march on. Do you think they can win the World Cup? Uh, they've got to improve. I mean, there's no point in saying yes, they can or, or no, they can't. Uh, they're a very talented bunch of lads, but they're not playing to their potential at the moment. OK, well, that's the thoughts on the football. What about the racing? It's the London Club's uh, uh, charity trophy for the top jockey. Frankie de has got lots of supporters. Yeah. Uh, where, would, where would your money go? Well, I'm going to go with uh, young Ryan Moore, uh, Richard Hannon. I think he's got an awful lot of good rides this week and I think he's great value at 20 to 1. Well, Kieran Fallon heads the market at two to one. Jamie Spencer's 130. Frankie de Tori, seven to two. Mick Kinane at 14 to one. With Robert Winston and Ryan Moore uh, at 20 to one. That is a, a race that will have lots of twists, lots of turns. But Kieran Fallon is the two to one favourite. Uh, Alan Ball, it's a bit like the World Cup, isn't it? There's going to be uh, plenty to be decided. And uh, well, if it was England and Germany again on the, the weekend, that would bring back a few memories, wouldn't it? Absolutely, great memories and some bad ones, but uh, you know what a what a great game. Um, but it's up to the lads tonight. Win that that league tonight, and I don't think they'll play the Germans or the Argentinians till late on. Alan Ball, thanks very much. The racing, of course, at Royal Ascot is out of this world. Fabulous. 30 races and uh, much of them on a new course here up the straight and many people looking to see just how fast this ground will be. We'll have a report on that a bit later. But let's have a look at the action for you today. This is what we have lined up. The Coventry Stakes we kick off with with some of the top two-year-olds in the country over six furlongs. Then we go on to the King's Stand Stakes. Three horses from Australia doing battle there. Take over target, the best from down under. The St James's Palace Stakes, the first of our Group 1s this afternoon, over the old mile. And Arafa, the 2000 Guineas winner from Ireland, takes part. And then on to the Queen Anne Stakes at 4.25, a mile, and some real crackers lined up there. And finally, our live coverage ends with the Ascot Stakes, two and a half miles, some really good handicappers. This is the new jockey's room. This is what the, uh, the luxury that these lads are enjoying underneath the stands. Makes a real difference from the old uh, jockey's room and facilities. Now, the non-runners for you. The 425, number three, Balanus, and five, Home Affairs. They are the non-runners. Balanus, uh, just not quite right and won't uh, take on 
pacemaking duties this afternoon. Let's have a look now at what we've got lined up in our program this afternoon. We have a very rare trip behind the scenes with trainer Jeremy Nesida, who guided Arafa to Irish 2000 Guineas victory and bids to follow up today in the St James's Palace. Hot favourite for the Queen Anne is this horse, Proclamation, having his first start for Sheikh Mohammed's Godolphin team, have an ordinary start to the season. The big danger to him could be this filly, Pires. Mick Kinnan takes over today because Kieran Fallon rides for Aidan O'Brien. Now, three years ago, the Australians came to Royal Ascot and they conquered, courtesy of Schwazir. They're on the takeover mission again today. Takeover target heading three Australian trained runners in the King's Stand Stakes. As well as all the racing, we will of course be giving you the top fashion tips. Today, Jodie Kidd bids to dress to thrill for just £150. And we'll be looking at great races from Royal Ascot in years gone by, including this stunning victory of Rock of Gibraltar just a few years ago for Alex Ferguson. Well, the paddock is just starting to fill up because the owners and trainers of the 21 runners in our first race of Royal Ascot 2006 are starting to make their way in. The runners around us as well. I've never known a bigger field for the Coventry. Well, plenty of time to build up to that, Willie, but we've been set a challenge. Sport, and this is an aid of sport relief. We've been given 50 quid each. Angus has got a tip and Jim's got a tip. Rishi's got a tip. And they said to me, well, what do you want to do? Jodie Kidd's got a tip. And I said, I'd team up with you. Right. Which might be a mistake. And we would pick a horse together. Right. So I'll it's your decision. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll have to win, yeah. won't it? What have you got? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll put all the weight on Michael Hill's shoulders in the big race, the Group 1 race, La Cucharacha. We're going to give it to a lady to get the money. It's not a Group 1 race, it's Group 2. Is King it a Group stand. 2? King yeah. Stand? Mm -hmm. We've got two Group 1s. That's Group 2. See, these are the big sprint, though. I'll oh, give you that. Big sprint. So and, we uh, are going combined for La Cucaracha. Now, the fashion team are splitting that. I think they've done very well here with two really decent fashion-based names, Dandy Man and Glamopus, both in that King stand as well. So we've got three different options for you in the 10 past three. Rishi's gone for Stormy River, the French train horse in the 350 the St James's Palace. Uh, Jim McGrath has gone for Major Caddo in, in this, this our opening race, the Coventry. Angus has gone for a £50 win on Proclamation. We've just seen Sheikh Mohammed actually and his wife, Princess Haya. Uh, they own Proclamation. That's in the Queen Anne. And Ian and Ray have gone for top the charts in oh. our final race, uh, the Queen's Vars. Now, all of those tips and all of today's racing uh, absolutely dependent upon the state of that ground out there. So let's find out about it. It's not only the stand that's undergone a multi-million pound redevelopment. The race course here itself has undergone some significant changes. Clark of the course, Chris Stickles is with me. Chris, can you explain some of those to us? Yeah, sure, Rishi. Well, the straight course has gone undergone complete reconstruction. Um, it, in fact, has moved 42 metres that way at the winning line here. It starts at the same place by the Golden Gates, and uh, all the old topsoil was removed. Um, that was mixed with sand. A new drainage layer was put on underneath the topsoil layer. The topsoil put back on, turf put back on, Cambers were built on both bends, and the under part, the most amazing thing really is that the two road crossings that we used to have have been eliminated. Now we've now got underpasses, so that it's a completely, completely sort of straight, safe, and consistent track. Okay, Chris, for the start of these very important five days, what's the ground like here? Good to firm. Have you had to water to keep it at that level of moisture? Yes, we have. We've done quite a bit of watering actually over the weekend and in the last sort of 24 hours, to be honest. Um, it was a drying weekend. Um, this is also a sand, you know, sand-based sort of construction. This this track is. So we've um, we did put quite a lot of water on last week and over the weekend and in the last. Yeah, we put about eight millimeters on last night in in places. Um, yes. Chris, good luck for the next five days. Thank you very much. Big day this for Chris Stickles. Well, he won't know how that ground is riding until these jockeys come back in after the first race and tell him, because it's one thing walking it, it's another thing how it feels on top of a horse. You can see Kieran Fallon in the background there. In the dark blue colours, he's on board Holy Roman Emperor in this uh, opening race. Ted Durkin there in the gold colours of Sheikh Rashid bin uh, Maktoum al Maktoum, or so, I should say Sheikh Rashid bin Mohammed. Uh, Helvellyn, those colours will be ca carried by. And it's going to be an exciting start, actually, this. It's very exciting indeed. Everybody will be sort of getting really, you know, up for it because the first race of the Royal Ascot on the new race course, uh, you know, it's just something special. And uh, 
I don't know if the jockeys will get a little uh, inaugural present off the race course. Maybe they should have You're done it. You're always looking for a present, aren't you? <laughs> and in terms of riding this course, and you noticed this when we were here for the pre-opening meeting, it rides a, a stiffer course. It's a, more of a test of stamina, do you think? Oh, it's a very stiff course. I ask it. You, all, you always wait till you get past that two furlong marker before you sort of go for it because the, the ground just keeps going up and up and up. And it is, it's a stiff galloping track and you need an animal who gets the whole of the distance wherever you're running over. It is a stiff track. It's a, what we call a galloping track. You know, we got plenty of stamina uh, in, in, you know, so in the horse because that is the reason the horses sometimes get caught close home. Well, one man who will have certainly worked out how to ride the old Ascot and is getting his head around the new Ascot is Frankie de Tori. He did have a winner here at the pre-opening meeting. We were just discussing how it rides a bit differently out there now. Yes, I mean, they made some changes. Uh, they made the bend uh, better, so they had to rise it to make it banked. So uh, it's, it's a little bit more stiffer than the old track, but, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a, a lot more fairer than the last time. Now, you've got big chances today, haven't you? You could have a huge day here. <laughs> well, I don't like when you say that. <laughs> Pressure. I mean, every race is a championship race. I've got good rides, but everybody else got good rides. Uh, we brought here our best horses and we hope for the best. Uh, we just need that little bit of luck. Because it's been a really slow start for Godolphin yeah. horses. People at home watching will be thinking, well, what's happened to them? I mean, exactly. I mean, today, uh, proclamation... Uh, back to his best form, he should run a huge race. Uh, I'm just keeping my fingers crossed. We have missed time, as you know, we had to close the stable for a couple of weeks. So is uh, we just stopped in the horses at Cherry Wright. Right and Frankie, what is the banker for the whole meeting? Your banker for yourself? That's, uh, that's a big question, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't like to say, they're all just as, uh, as good. Do you know, like do you know what say? I was about to say? Saved by the bell. Yeah, saved by the bell. Thank <laughs> you. We will wait and see, I think, is the answer to that. Thank good you. luck. Good luck to Bye Frankie Dottori. He's got proclamation coming up later today, who's a hot favourite. And he does love this place. Well, it must make him feel great when he walks back in through the gates here. And of course, after riding those seven winners, anybody would feel special. And, and he rode the seven winners, not on an ordinary day. He rode it on a real big day, you know, the Festival of Ascot. Uh, it's a very, very special. He'll go to his grave remembering that day. I never did anything quite like that. Nothing near like yeah, that. you did. You had six winners. Ah, yes, but... I, but, but that, not was not big th day. that was not that was That was the Pittman's Derby Day, but uh, not quite. A, a, a it's disaster. interesting though. Frankie is the most successful jockey jointly riding at the Royal Meeting. Now he's out in front on 37 winners, but he was joined last year when the meeting was at York by Mick Canan. Uh, Frankie had to miss the meeting last year. He picked up a suspension, missed the whole week. Uh, Mick Canan, in the meantime, rode five winners and caught up with him. So they're level at the top of the jockey standings of current jockeys riding. But bear in mind that Lester Piggott rode over. Over a hundred Royal Ascot did, winners, didn't yes. he? But uh, Mick Canan's got some decent rides here this week, and he will be riding a few winners, I am sure. He might even ride one today in PRS. Yeah, that's true. He yes. could for Very Sir Michael so. Stout. Uh, well, let's take a check on this enormous field for the Coventry. Twenty-one runners. Jim, I was saying earlier, I don't think I can ever remember a field as big as this for the opening race of the meeting. Might have been uh, a long time ago, but not in my time anyway. Claire, number one in our first, the Coventry is Baby Strange, Robbie Fitzpatrick, two is Baltimore Jack, Dean McEwen, three Captain Marvellous, Michael Hills, four Carson Spirit, Chris Catlin, five is Chimes, Pat Smullen, six is Deadshot King, Jamie Spencer, seven every man for himself, Eddie O'Hearn, eight is Hammer's Boy, Wayne Lorden, number nine is Harold Vallon, Ted Durkin, down to uh, 10, Holy Roman Emperor, over from Valley Doyle in Ireland, Kieran Fallon. 11 is Joburg, Mick Canan. 12, Johannesburg, Jack, Steve Drown. 13, Kalgoorlie, the Mount of Shane Kelly. 14 is La Neige, uh, Tony Culhane. 15, Major Caddo, Richard Hughes. 16 is Mubashir, Frankie de Tory. 17 is Prince Golan, Darrow Donoghue. Number 18 is Sadiq. Neil Callan, 19, Tariq is Alan Munro, 20, uh, Tudor Prince, Jimmy Fortune, and 21, Zephonical Storm is Karen McAvoy. They're the 21 runners in our first, the first of 30 races at this Royal Meeting for 2006, the Coventry Stakes. And this is the course they take, as you heard Frankie de Tori saying before, a little bit stiffer since they've realigned it. And there they are, right up to the winning post. It's a straight six furlongs and it takes some getting as well. 
example, the first race of the Royal Meeting and already some really interesting uh, betting developing in the Coventry. Holy Roman Emperor, who was a top price 3-1 to one with Stan James this morning, has been very easy to back and is currently the 4-1 to one favourite and I have seen 9-2 to two on the rails. Hal Valin, who was as big as 6-1 to one this morning, is a very solid second favourite at 9-2. to two. Major Caddo is 6-1 to one from 13-2. to two. That's been bigger this morning and is also pretty solid here on the track. Can't see much bigger than six at the moment. Sadiq is 10 to 1 and Baby Strange was a big springer in the market this morning from 20 to 1 into 12 to 1 but hasn't moved from that tri uh, price since the betting opened uh, here in the Coventry. It's 12 to 1 Joe Berg and 12 to 1 Tariq and 20 to 1 and upwards the rest. That includes every man for himself, Mubashir and here the outsiders, those the uh, uh, horses that the each way punters will be looking at. But remember this isn't a handicap despite this 21 runners it's only three places if you're on each way but the focus of this market is held well in the strength of that and the weakness of this holy roman emperor who was a shorter price than it is at the moment currently the four to one favorite the runners for this opening race of the meeting making their way out onto the course through this newly designed tunnel so that uh, the race goes can pass over the top. The horse is coming through the tunnel. Actually, there was quite a lot of speculation that had George Washington, the brilliant winner of the 2000 guineas, had he been fit to run in the St. James's Palace Stakes today, would he have come through this tunnel? Because he's a horse with a fair old attitude. Now, the Bally... He would have gone through there. It's quite, you know, it's quite big, but you can, I can see the point. The yes. Ballydoll team have Holy Roman Emperor in this race. As Angus was telling you, he's just drifted out to 4-1 to one from 7-2. to two. He's the favourite. Kieran Fallon deliberately kept him at the back of the whole... Of the, he went the whole out last. field and he went out onto the course he's a, last. He's a compact, he's a typical two-year-old type. You know, his, pe his pedigree is, is quite nice, but he's really compact and he does look like a, a two-year-old. So hopefully that uh, he'll go well there. And it's very interesting, you know, Holy Roman Emperor, if he wins, his son runs later. His son? Yeah, Archduke Ferdinand. Was the son of the Holy Roman? Correct. Very good historical knowledge, Willie. We'll probably get lots of emails and texts in saying that's completely incorrect. But there is Holy Roman Emperor making his way down to the start. Could he get Aidan O'Brien and Kieran Fallon off to a winning start in this opening race? What Coventry. a lovely action he has. Look how he floats. Easy action. He will handle this uh, good to fast ground here. And he's a horse who's already worth a fortune. He's by Danehill, who was champion sire, took over from Saddle as well. This is the last crop. Exactly. I was going to say, and Danehill died. And this, sadly, is, is the last of his representatives that we will see coming through onto the race course. Uh, Holy Roman Emperor, lovely looking horse, but there are 20 others who are taking him on and uh, one of those who is also unbeaten is Baby Strange. Now, I think the owners of Baby Strange, who are the Market Avenue Racing Club, get top marks for kit because the horse has an orange cap, your colours, so consequently you all have orange bands. Exactly. I mean, it's the, the colours the club's worn now, over 20 odd winners in three years and we're club going places and we've got another one like this hopefully back home to come, so hopefully Baby will do us proud today. And you can just shout, come on baby, which is easy. Exactly, come on baby, but he's earned his right to be here and whatever the outcome, we've all had a great day of the people here today. Have, have you enjoyed it already so far? What do you make of this place? Oh, it's fantastic, really done a great job, haven't they? We've chuffed a bit, so yeah, really good. Well, there is Baby Strange, just slightly getting on his toes. Does he tend to do that? In all fairness, I mean, he's, he did it at Bath. Um, he did it here last time. I'd say he's 50% better behaved today, actually, than uh, um, here last time. And if he behaves 50% better on the race course, hopefully, we'll, uh, Her Majesty will do us proud and give us the trophy. That'll be great. Well, that would... <laughs> Don't start laughing, will you? You're 11 to 1. I'll let you go off and get your money on. Good Thank luck you. with Baby Strange. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Good luck. Cheers, Good luck to you. Cheers, really. Well, Peter Chappellheim has been in the winner's enclosure after the Coventry Stakes once before. That was for Stonehatch. Peter, you've also finished second a couple of times, you were telling me. What about your horse here, Tarek, who's just had the one start? <coughs> uh, he's, he's quite immature. He's probably not a real professional yet. Uh, it's a very tough race, but uh, I suppose if you're not in, you can't win. He started a 14-1 to 1 on that first run. He did win impressively. Did he surprise you? Did he surprise people at home? He's not the greatest workhorse at home, so, yeah, knowing my lads, 14-1 to 1 was a bit of a shock, yeah. Uh, so, but... Uh, yeah, he's, he, he goes like a nice horse, whether he's a Coventry winner, time will tell. Peter, just a word about the draw here at Ascot. Obviously, it's early days. You're in stall 15. Have you got any thoughts on that yet? Uh, normally, that wouldn't be a good draw in the, in the days before, but the, the better horses seem to be drawn with us, so hopefully it might be OK. Uh, I suppose good horse can win from anywhere, but we'll, we'll soon find out, won't we? Peter, good luck. Cheers, thanks. Cool. Thanks very much.
Now the runners are arriving down at the post for this Coventry Stakes. Now all the races we're going to show you this week are going to be competitive. But Ray, this is a particularly difficult race because the inexperienced horses and so many of the market leaders in today's race have not run on this fast ground. You're quite right. And plus the fact they're running with six furlongs up a very, very stiff track and they're all across the field because the experience might just kind of get some of them. The one we see there, Helvellyn, for instance, he's had two runs. He's won both of them, one in April at Leicester, one in May at Pontefract. But they've both been on much softer ground, although he's done it very impressively. We still don't know, and nobody really knows how well he'll go on the ground. No, they don't. But the one thing we are sure of, he's got a lot of ability, he's got a lot of speed, and he's got a fair bit of class about him. As you can see, he's a grand type of animal. Pick of the paddock. There's Major Caddo in the purple and yellow colours. He, again, has had one run. He beat two of today's rivals. The one who finished closer to him was a horse called Joe Berg. Uh, that was over six furlongs on soft ground at Newbury. So we don't know again with him, although he comes from Richard Hannon's stable, who have a lot of good two rods running this week. And this is the one he's picked for probably the best two-year-old race of the week. More than likely. This was a, he was a very nice winner of what looked a, a decent race at Newbury. Newbury usually turns up some of the good maids, and this is a very nice horse. He deserves to take his chance here. The horse of Amanda Perrett, which ran behind him, was a little bit green that day, and uh, there won't be much between them here. Major Caddo will come from one against the Stanside Wales and stall number two. Here is uh, Sadiq. He's had two runs. He's got a little bit warm. Um, I think he got a bit warm at Epsom, didn't he, when we saw him winning the woodcut stakes. But the thing about that Epsom run was that was on relatively fast ground, like he's going to get today. So we know that's no problem for him. And here it is. It was. He popped out that this day at Epsom and Neil Callan rode him. He went straight to the front immediately and he battled on really, really well when he was tackled. He, he knuckled on. He did this at, at York when he won there and he beat the Brian horse there. Nice type of animal. The track will suit him. As I said, the ground is OK for him. He's going to take a bit of beating here. He's a good type of animal. So, Sadiq. Winning on Derby Day at Epsom and bidding now for Kevin Ryan to win the first race at Royal Ascot on the opening day of the meeting. Well, a lively market, but so different from it was uh, this morning. But still, Holy Roman Emperor is favourite, but only just. It's sort of hanging on in there at four to one. Helvellyn is very popular, second choice at nine to two. It's not impossible that they go joints, uh, but at the moment, Holy Roman Emperor is the favourite. Major Cadeau is six to one. Sadiq is ten to one. Baby Strange, the horse they backed this morning at twenties into twelves, has been nibbled out here on the track and is elevens from twelves. But Holy Roman Emperor still at the moment just favourite for the Coventry at four to one. Well, I can understand why Holy Roman Empire is, uh, Emperor is so well fancied. Aidan O'Brien has a fabulous record with two-year-olds and at this meeting as well. There was a horse I really liked in the paddock, but, but Willie told me that he's bred for staying and he won't win over six furlongs. That's Prince Golan. He's I didn't actually say he's that. He's already in the stall, so you can't see the horse who, who is beautiful looking. I just think one day he's going to be a really nice He is a nice really looking nice horse. horse. He's by Golan. And of course, Golan won over a mile and a half. He won here the, the King George beating Nea. So you would imagine him not having fast two-year-olds. Now that's Holy o Roman Emperor and he's going to go forward into stall 13, pretty much in the middle of the field. We, it'll take a couple of races before we can work out what effect the draw might have on this new race course. Of, of course it's going to be... Well